starting out on the Senate story. Uh, I have no idea what time it is. I haven't had it. Um, which is good. But I mean, like, of course, it's not going to be you know, solid. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's more like put like All right. into attention, everyone. <laughs> um, Hi, my name is Philip Athens, um, and, the, and you're here for Meet the Book Editors. Oh, you and and yeah. no one can hear me. I'm sorry. How do you get that off of there? I'm going to start singing some of my greatest hits. <laughs> as a okay, then. Thank you very much. This is weird to hold a microphone. Hi, I feel like I should do like a tight 10-minute set. You know. <laughs> Where are you from? Um, <laughs> so, we are all book editors. Uh, past, present, and future. Um, and so let's, let's run through really quickly and, and just sort of say hello to everybody and meet people. Me first, because it's alphabetical order, and you know I've been resting on that one for a long time. Um, this is a little bit about me. Please write down stuff like my blog, fantasy handbook at wordpress.com or dot wordpress.com, and that's how you find me on Twitter. Um, I post every Tuesday about writing science fiction and fantasy and sort of pu the publishing business and all sorts of interesting stuff. And uh, look for me teaching classes at Bellevue College, too, open to all. This is Nina. Look, you can see it's, it, she matches the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Currently the editor-in-chief of D&D uh, &D novels at Wizards of the Coast and uh, New York Times bestselling author in her own right. Uh, children's books and other things, yeah. right? Uh, Jack Cokey, uh, managing editor of Per Aspera Press, um, here, right here in Seattle, uh, al also an author. Um, I read his Shadowrun stuff back in the day, big Shadowrun fan. And then here's Fleetwood. Fleetwood Robbins, also from Wizards of the Coast, um, came there via Del Rey Books. And James Sutter from Paizo, um, which I guess, <laughs> I guess is good enough. And, and there's his bio up there, so please write it down into your notebooks. We'll wait. No, we won't. The microphone is making me crazy. <laughs> um, so this is it. I mean, really, I just want, I didn't really have an agenda or, or a speech to make, so I, I really wanted to just throw this open to your questions, and let's, let's talk about um, writing and getting published and how to put your best foot forward once you actually have a completed manuscript, uh, what editors are looking for, what we're not looking for, uh, do's and don'ts and that kind of thing. Everybody ready? Oh, and we need you to go to the microphone because this is live streaming and no one will be able to hear you if you don't go to the microphone. Go to the microphone or this is it. We'll have to leave. I'm going to start singing. <laughs> don't be shy. Don't do it. Don't do it to the, your fellow congoers. There you go. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, I actually have a question on the other side of things. Um, on the editing, publishing side, how do you get into that sort of industry? Uh, do you have any stories of where you started editing and publishing? Who wants to take that? Let's throw um, that one at Nina first. Okay. Well, I um, started editing. I graduated college not really knowing what I wanted to do with my life, like many people, and I was actually an art history major. So my first tip is you don't have to be an English major. Um, many editors that I know have been any various kinds of, of majors at college. Uh, one of our former coworkers was an anthropology major, I've known people that were chemistry majors. Anyway, so you don't have to be an English major. Um, I took a publishing course that was held at Radcliffe College at the time, and now it's um, at NYU. Um, the summer after I graduated and decided that I, from doing that, that I wanted to be an editor. Uh, I started out doing art, art books because of my art history background uh, and realized I disliked that whole environment. <laughs> um, it's very pretentious and just not my style. So. Um, I ended up in children's books, and um, I got a job as an editorial assistant at Harcourt in New York City. Uh, publishing is really an apprenticeship type of industry, and so that's the other thing is you really need to um, start at the bottom and find someone that's willing to teach you what you need to know. Um, 
And long story short, I decided I didn't want to live in New York anymore, moved out to Seattle, um, and eventually got a position working at Wizards where I um, started doing started out there doing children's books for them. So that's my story. It, it does also help to be in New York. Um, Definitely. Primarily, that's where most of the publishing houses are. So That's what I've heard. Yeah. At least to get your start. I mean, I think we've all obviously managed to find something here, but there's not a lot um, elsewhere. So your opportunities are limited, and there's people who have experience looking for jobs in Seattle. So that's really, if you want to get started, you need to go to New York. And, you know, I, I started in publicity originally, so... You know, if, if you can get your foot in the door and get into a company, um, I just suggest that you just try to do that. You know, it, uh, it can't do anything but help you to learn more about, you know, kind of the publishing business in general. Yeah, and I think also, especially now in, the, in this sort of climate where there's a lot of indie publishing and uh, in this kind of Kickstarter environment where there's, you know, smaller companies and things like that, uh, one of the ways that I actually started at TSR is, is I had gotten out of college and was writing and was very frustrated that there was no market for, you know, my incredibly awesome <laughs> prose. And I at the time, you know, being 20 years old, you don't think, well, maybe I'm just not good. <laughs> maybe I just need to write better. It was, no, I need to, you know, I need to lead the charge in, in creating the next, you know, wave of literary magazines and got into what at the time was sort of the micro press boom and started my own magazine that was kind of based on, on the punk fanzines at the time and just made it up as I went along. I taught myself the magazine publishing business. Um, not really well, <laughs> but um, that gave me some real e exposure and some and some uh, some real experience in working with authors and working with with text and and just the business in general. And so when there was a I, you know there was an, an opportunity at TSR, I had something that I had created for myself, um, you know that was sort of my own self ap apprenticeship or, or self internship. You guys? You go first. Sure. Um, so I, similar to Phil, I started off with, um, I didn't get hired in, at a company in New York. I um, basically got into it through uh, my agent, um, my writing agent, who was also editing um, for Random House. And um, he, I guess I need to speak louder. Um, <laughs> so he had more editing um, than he could do, and he basically w asked me if I wanted to do some of it, and I was like, I'll try, you know. But it turned out I was good at it, and, and um, I ended up uh, starting a business with him, uh, book doctoring, um, and I supported myself book doctoring for about a decade, and, um, and then <laughs> segued into sort of learning the publishing, sort of I started small press with my wife, um, and we started editing other people's stuff as well. I mean, I was editing other people's stuff, but this time it was actually stuff that I wanted to edit as opposed to stuff that I was being paid to, uh, to doctor. So that's how I got into it. Um, so I started as a writer as well. I actually started as a journalist, and I was working in a newspaper um, and eventually discovered that though I really loved writing, um, facts and reporting w were really boring. <laughs> um, and so I was looking for something where I could write but not have to worry about actually, you know, I wanted to just make up whatever I was doing. So I looked around and found that Dragon and Dungeon magazines were at the time based out of uh, Bellevue. Uh, and so I approached them with my portfolio because I had written a bunch of stuff. Uh, and they said, well, you're, you seem great. Um, we also don't have any openings, but we'll see what we can find for you. And so my foot in the door was uh, finding JPEGs for their web store at a nickel a pop. Um, and so I did that for a little while and worked my way up and then was an editor on Dungeon Magazine, and then when we created Pathfinder, uh, I you know did a lot of that, and then now I'm in charge of a lot of the Pathfinder stuff and also all the novels we do. Um, so to me, I think that writing is really, uh, being able to have a portfolio of work that you've done and been paid for by someone is really useful. Even if it's somebody small, it shows that you know, you're sort of uh, serious about it. And I should say also that, you know, the, the opportunity for kind of uh, 
self-publishing and DIY sort of stuff like Phil, you know, used to maybe cut and paste paper onto paper and Xerox it. I don't know. But now, I mean, there's just so many more uh, avenues open to you. And with kind of traditional publishing and traditional publishing houses being more oriented toward, you know, big bestsellers, they don't really have, uh, they don't really have the patience to uh, build kind of um, mid-list authors and to, and, to, and to really grow people. They want to know that there's an immediate audience that's there's gigantic. And, you know, they really push for that, that 20,000, 30,000 copies that they're going to get out the door. So if you feel like you know uh, you have an audience for something, um, you know, try to reach them. Just look for them and, you know, do whatever you can, whether it's digital, whether it's print. Um, there is really an opportunity to, to, to find an audience and to be able to appeal to people. I like to think of it as kind of a... Uh, Similar to in the 90s with, you know, with, uh, with, with music, in you had all these kind of corporate rock conglomerations that were just publishing you know, crap all the time. And, um, but there was this huge audience of people who weren't really interested in, in kind of radio play in you know, Bob Seger or whatever. No offense to Bob Seger fans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but... Um, so all of these independent, uh, independent uh, uh, record labels started popping up and, and putting out music that you know, maybe wasn't, didn't have mass appeal, but there was certainly an audience out there. And I think that we're in a very similar time with publishing now. Yeah. And, and you don't have to be a writer either. Like right. you can find Absolutely. there are tons of these small or mid-sized presses popping up. Um, and if what you really want to do is edit, not write, just go to them and say, hey, I'd love to help out. What can I do? And most of them need slush readers. They need somebody to go through the giant stack of submissions and find the ones that are, you know, the best. Um, because most editors do not have time to do all that themselves. I mean, like you were just yeah. saying. So one of our, I mean, we had, we don't now, but we had uh, interns that we hired. I mean, we paid them very tiny amount and hired. Uh, <laughs> exactly <laughs> hired um, and they would read slush because we would get two to three uh, submissions a day when we're when we were open we are not open at the moment but um, partly because I don't have interns to read the slush um, one of those interns went on and got hired at, at wizards and um, you know is well she was an editor now she's a writer <laughs> so success story there yeah. Yeah, a lot, a lot of internships can be really useful, especially if you can intern for a company you'd like to work with in the long term. Um, that's That worked for me. Yeah. So. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Yeah. Next question. Yeah, go for it. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> he just fixed that. Isn't that awesome? Hi. Hi. Okay. So uh, for aspiring writers, um, some advice, I guess. Um, like, what are you guys basically sick of reading? And um, what advice do you have for, you know, carving a niche in the sci-fi fantasy universe where there are so many tropes and popular story elements that, you know, people like to read? So how do you, I oh. guess, stay original but stay within the universe? Oh, oh man, I've got one. <laughs> uh, uh, so I don't know about you guys, but... Um, I am really sick of reading Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder, unless it's specifically for Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> or Pathfinder. Um, I really like, I mean, even though what I commission and what I buy is tie-in work, uh, so things set in the Pathfinder world, when I'm reading stuff, you know, stuff that's not specifically media tie-in, I want something original. I don't want just Tolkien with the serial numbers filed off. I don't want just a transcript of your of your D and D or Pathfinder game. Like I want to see something something original, just something that I haven't thought about before. That's why I like science fiction and fantasy, is because it shows me new cultures and new landscapes. So feel free to get creative. Yeah, I I can second that. I guess I do have. I didn't want to hold it, but I guess I have to hold the microphone. <laughs> um, you know, I think that. I can speak for every editor in the publishing business. Everybody wants to discover the next J.K. Rowling. Everybody wants to discover the next Harry Potter, the next Stephanie Meyer. But if you approach that as, I'm going to write my sparkly vampire, you know, and it's going to be set in Squim, Washington, and not Forks, 
then that's not it, right? That we don't we don't mean literally the next one. But what but what everyone is looking for is that original take on on even if it's existing things. Obviously, Stephanie Meyer didn't invent the vampire, and J.K. Rowling didn't invent fantasy or wizards, but they did something, just a little bit of a twist that really captured people and and got you know, uh, a tremendous readership. So I think that's what everybody is really looking for is that next original take on it that uh, can, can explode. But if you're just repeating, if you're to sort of have Twilight open in one hand and then your other hand on the <laughs> keyboard, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna work for you. Um, the publishing business does those knockoffs, but <laughs> they, the, they've already been done, certainly for Harry Potter and Twilight, and those are they're, they've got authors that they call right away. Like, I, I'm hearing about this Twilight thing. Give me one of those. Okay, that's already done. So if you're just out there, you're never going to be able to surf those trends. Create your own trend. I think for anything, it comes especially with fantasy, it comes down to creating strong, interesting characters and an interesting world. Um, and I'm going to plug Bill's class. He does a really good world-building workshop. Is it a mm -hmm. workshop? Um, yeah, as well as a continuing education class. So okay. anybody yeah. Can so I, I think if you look at Harry Potter, you know there'd been hundreds of stories already published about wizards going to wizard school, and you know why was this particular one such such a success? I think partly it's that she did such a great job of building that world, and people really connect to that world of Hogwarts so much so that you know they've built a theme park around it, right? So. Um, that's just incredibly important for fantasy. <coughs> and you know, I'll, I'll kind of follow up on that question with another question. Are there, I don't want this to be like the negative thing, what are the really horrible, you know, uh, slush pile stories, but if everybody can kind of give me one thing, one don't, just whatever you do, don't, when you're in, in, in uh, on the subject of, of actually uh, submitting material. Like don't, go. don't argue with a rejection, ever. <laughs> like it just, it, oftentimes, I mean, every editor has so many authors trying to write for them uh, that it's just, it's shooting yourself in the foot because if they rejected your story, maybe it's because they truly, they truly hate it and it's up on the dartboard in the office, but much more likely it just wasn't quite there and you're probably up against some incredible talents so it's not even necessarily that your stuff isn't good, it's just that you got beat out by somebody who's incredible. Um, but, so I mean, most of the time when an author sends a rejection, especially if the author, or if the editor says, hey, you know, send me more of your stuff in the future, um, that really is an invitation to keep working with them. Mm. But if, you, if they say, sorry, we, you know, we can't accept this, and you say, clearly you didn't understand the brilliance of my story, which people do all the time, it ensures that even if your next story was brilliant, I'm not gonna buy it. I mean, I, you know, I don't really like to blacklist people, but there have definitely been a couple of authors that I've said, wow, I don't care how good that guy might get in the future. I am never publishing anything by him because he's such a jerk. Don't be, don't be a jerk, it, yeah. be businesslike. I mean, the thing is, it's a, once you, especially with a novel, and I, I, I think the same is true with a short story, is that if you're, if you're an author and you're trying to get published, uh, you're gonna be working with an editor. That editor's gonna be working with you on an ongoing basis. And if you're a jerk, they're not gonna want to. And they're not gonna wanna start that relationship at all. So just be professional. Um, I think my story is that um, I used to get queries, and this isn't really a, well, I would say don't ever do this, but um, I would get queries that basically start off with, I am so awesome and you're, you can't, I know you can't wait to buy this because it's the best thing ever. And I would be like, okay, well you set the bar high already because if it's not the best thing ever, you're not gonna buy it. And usually, of course, it wasn't. Um, so don't, don't, I guess in a query letter, you wanna, you wanna be professional, you wanna introduce yourself. Um, if you have credentials, put them in there give a very like brief description of your story or your novel I guess in, in my in my case it would be a novel um, and that's it can I just do a quick add-on to sure, that sure. Um, the reverse is also true don't 
be too humble. Like, I mean, humility is good, but if you write me a query level that's a letter that says, hey, I know this novel isn't very good, but it's the best <laughs> right. that I can do, exactly. and I thought that maybe you wanted it, it's like, it's a double-edged sword. Either exactly. you... Either it's actually crap, in which case you're telling the truth, <laughs> or it's great, in which case you're a liar and have some sort of issues. So either way, exactly. I can't buy that book. Yeah. Plus, you need to be confident enough that if they do, if the publisher does buy your book, they're going to believe that when you go out to market your book, to go to signings, that you're going to be confident and you're going to you know, promote your own work. Yeah. And that's important. So important. I mean, I'm, I might add that you should... You should keep working. You know, if if you're getting rejected on a certain story, you know, just don't keep shopping that story. You don't be afraid to just kind of put it aside and, and do more work. I mean, that's really the only way you're going to get better is to is just to keep writing, and you know, eventually those uh, those rejections will become uh, acceptances. You you never know. So, hopefully, just keep working. And well. Oh. No, I'll, I'll add to that is that when I was starting off writing, I wrote, um, I probably wrote 75 stories and my 50th or something was my first sale. Um, I just kept working at it and I mean, some of those sold eventually, the early ones, and some of them never sold and never will sell and I don't even know if I still have them because they shouldn't have sold. <laughs> I, I think that's incredibly important. Persistence really is is a key value. Um, I, I, I've been in publishing in one capacity or another for 28 years, 20 something like that, a long, wow, I'm old, and so a long time. And I, I've rejected thousands and thousands and thousands of manuscripts in that time, I mean thousands of them but I've never rejected a person. It's never been, I hate you, so I'm not gonna publish your book, ever. Um, I've read some stuff that was comically awful, um, and I've read some stuff that was brilliant, but I could the vampire furniture thing that we just couldn't figure out how to sell this. <laughs> but I, I mean, I will, I, this book will, is carved into my memory. I love this thing, and I can't believe nobody's published that yet. <laughs> I'm going to go find that person and do a whole Kickstarter, so get ready for vampire <laughs> furniture. But, um, you know, I, and I, in that time, I've never said, you know, I hate you because of some political reason. I hate you because you did this. You know, it's not personal. It really is just, I can't do something with this piece of writing right now for whatever reason. Uh, you said point them out, oh. like, at yourself. Like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to get my inner Roger Daltrey. Yeah, okay. exactly. Like there you go. Right. There we go. That's more <laughs> Lemmy Kilmeister. Up here. <laughs> <laughs> um, another or uh, don't. Okay, don't put your picture in a query letter. I've seen <laughs> that many times, and it's very weird. Um, that doesn't make you stand out in a good way. Um, don't call editors on the phone. Um, I have had. <laughs> That's just I our preference, really. Yeah. It's not really. Just do it. We're not, in this jo we're not in this job because we like talking to people yeah. a little well. We prefer. <laughs> we don't like people. <laughs> no. Uh, I, I just I feel bad. We keep acting like writers are such jerks, and we really don't feel that way. I, I think I can speak for everyone. But we've had, I think everyone here has had a weird experience where um, my weird experience was I had a guy calling me persistently for like two weeks on the phone asking why um, I had rejected his manuscript. And so, yes, that, that can be really awkward, um, just uncouth. Yeah, I mean, we, you don't always have time to give a detailed uh, kind of explanation of a rejection. So, um, you know, if you get one, that's great. Uh, if you don't get one, it's, you shouldn't take it personally. And, and if you do, you should take it as a sign of encouragement. Yeah, yeah, because absolutely. if the editor actually took time to write a note about like, hey, I think, you know, here's what was wrong with it. Um, they didn't have to do that. It means that your story struck some sort of chord with them because most editors, I think, you know, some huge percentage of the manuscripts, they just send a form rejection. So if you're getting an individual rejection letter, that's, I mean, that's not an acceptance, but that's right below it. It means you were close enough that they think you're worth saving. So take heart in that. And do not send your own cover art. 
Uh, even oh if you're God. a brilliant artist that says, uh, you don't think we know what we're doing. We don't, you know, oh, how, how do we have to have cover art for this book? We didn't realize that. Just <laughs> never, ever, ever, ever do that. Ever do that. Now, if you're writing an illustrated children's picture book, yes. and, you know, then, and you're a yes. good illustrator. And you're yeah. the illustrator, right. then absolutely, or you're working with an illustrator together, absolutely. But if you're writing a novel and here's your cover painting, like Gentleman Broncos kind of thing, just no. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question? The next question? Was that okay? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hey. Um, for those who are sort of now just starting the submitting process, um, there seems to be some confusion. Do you send? Some are like send agents first. Some are send to houses first. Is you there any novels or short stories? Novels in particular. Okay. Yeah, short stories are kind of not really it's just a different. Process. Yeah, yeah, agents don't really care about those as much, I guess. So yeah. Yeah. Any I thoughts? I guess. I think the common practice this day, these days is to start with an agent. Mm -hmm. Most houses are closed to submission except through agents. That's what I would say. And, yeah, and, and I think that you know if if you, there are some. Uh, publishers that do accept unsolicited submissions. Whatever you're doing, and whether it's going to an editor or a publishing company or an agent, and if they've got some guidelines, something on their website that says this is what we want, don't think of that as sort of a challenge. Like I'm going to do something completely different yeah. and then set myself apart as, as being extra brilliant. What that generally does is, oh good, I don't have to read this. I can just uh, uh, reject it out of hand. So it, just take those rules as though they were carved into the stone tablets by the Almighty himself. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds awful, but that's pretty much it. Do exactly what they say. If they say send three chapters, send exactly three chapters. And if it's a one-page synopsis, that doesn't mean reformat until your five pages fit on one page. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Because I think that's a pet peeve of everybody. Yeah. I don't know. I, I didn't used to wear glasses before I started this job. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it, and just, you know, have that stuff in your arsenal or take a week or a few days to, you know, to create that um, um, that package for that, that agent, that editor, whoever it, it may be. And, you know, we probably should make a distinction between work for hire publishing mm -hmm. and traditional publishing. Uh, Fleetwood and I at Wizards and I would yeah. think that Paizo does prim exclusively work for hire. Yeah. Um, but Jack does, I don't know, what what is the, uh, the opposite term? Traditional, traditional publishing? Traditional, more traditional. Yeah. So the <laughs> difference around. is when you do work for hire publishing, you are selling your copyright to the publisher. Um, and sometimes the terms of the cop of the contract are different. Um, in our case, we still pay in advance plus a royalty. Some places don't do that; they will just pay a flat fee. Um, but the difference, the main difference, is that Wizards of the Coast then own the copyright to the work. Mm -hmm. And in that case, in the submissions process, um, you don't have to have um, an agent for that. Um, well, so. We pay you so little; it's probably better not to. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean the main. Well, uh, the main difference, I think, is that with work for hire, there's not very much leeway in the contract, so there's not a reason to have an agent, I don't think, because right. you we're can't not really change you, it just for you. It yeah. can't get you more money than you're going to make by having to pay the agent, or then you're going to have to pay the agent. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, and from m in my case, I'm so small that um, I mean, our advances are tiny if we pay at all. So, you're not. I mean. We do take agented submissions, but we also take unagented submissions um, when we're open. Yeah. <laughs> for submissions. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, um, you know, also being work for hire, you don't need an agent to get in at Paizo, but the one thing uh, I would always say about work for hire is, uh, and I maybe this is different with Wizards, I know sometimes you've done open call stuff in the past, but don't write the novel based on a property, uh, whether it's D and D, Pathfinder, Star Trek, whatever. Don't go to the uh, IP owner and say, "I already wrote this amazing Star Trek novel. Publish this," um, because that generally doesn't work. Most of the time, if you're doing work for hire, you're sort of auditioning. Um, you know, you're not writing. It's like you're going to them and saying, "Here's what I can do. What would you like me to do?" Um, and then generally, they'll have guidelines of the sort of book they want. Um, I always feel kind of terrible when somebody emails me and says, you know, hey, I wrote a uh, 200,000 word Pathfinder opus. 
Um, and I have to say, you know, sorry, we don't accept that. Like, you know, maybe you could send me samples and I'll see if we'll hire you for something in the future, but I'm not just going to take your book wholesale because that doesn't serve the needs of the brand and the IP. And I presume that's the same way you guys yes, were. Yes, absolutely. absolutely, yeah. And the other problem with that is that if you do have uh, somebody else's intellectual property in your novel, you can't actually publish it. Yeah, no one else can that. touch it. Yeah, so right. it's a dangerous thing to do. Uh, uh, Re-agents, though, uh, you know, agents can be, are, are, are very helpful in that um, if they're a good agent and a reputable agent, they're going to, they're going to know uh, editors and know what those editors like, and they're going to know what certain houses are looking for, and they're going to be able to help you a lot. Um, I guess the, the, the thing is just to watch out for kind of less reputable agents and, you know, don't sign anything that, that gives them exclusivity with you or unless, of course, you know, someone from, you know, uh, I don't know, like a, like a big house, then, well, maybe, but I doubt they'd ask you to. So anyway, um, but if they ask you to pay uh, yeah, for no. their consideration, right. definitely that's a, that's a, that's yeah. a no go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, As a writer, money should always go towards you. A good yeah. agent takes a cut of what they helped bring you, and yeah. can actually be worthwhile if um, you know if you're trying to sell your first novel um, and you have an agent, you're probably going to get a better advance as long as it's not work for hire. Um, I think last time I checked, it was like the standard advance for a first novel was like 5,000, but if you had an agent, it was like 10,000 averaged over a whole bunch of authors. So an editor or an agent can earn their keep that way, but you gotta make sure they're actually earning it. Yeah, and a good agent also doesn't put you in, I, I've said it, and I think we've all probably said it, it's called the slush pile, mm -hmm. which is those, and it sounds terrible, it sounds really insulting, and we really don't mean it that way most of the time, but, it, and, and it really is just a giant pile of blind submissions or of, of unsolicited submissions. And, and in some cases, that can be a huge pile. And, you know, what a good agent does is he gets that or she gets that to the top of the pile or bypasses the slush pile completely and puts it right into the hands of an editor and then follows up. Did you get a chance to read that? What do you think? What if we did this? You're right. So you actually have... And there are, I, for me, there's two kinds of agents. There's the salesperson and the lawyer. And you want to make sure that your agent is a salesperson. That's what that agent is supposed to do. They're out, now they become your commission sales force to go out and sell your book. If you need a lawyer, get a lawyer. Right? So keep an eye on, is this, somebody, is this an agent who's telling you, ah, they're trying to screw us and we're going to go in there and we're going to hammer out this deal? That's kind of a warning sign. Um, agents tend to be really friendly with editors and you know want everybody to be happy. Thank you. Next question. So we've kind of gone over the query letter a little bit, but I was also wondering like how much of information about the story you would like into the query letter and also um, I think like a couple of years ago I was at one of your panels and you kind of went over like the do's and don'ts of the first chapter or whatever gets sent in, and so I just figured that'd be a good question to ask everybody. Uh, just the most obvious is, oh my God, spell check. Um, <laughs> like seriously, proofread your cover letter and your, you know, your first chapter. Proofread that stuff as many times as you can. Get other people to do it because as an editor, um, I know that if I buy your book, I'm gonna have to edit that book. And so if I read the first couple of pages and I'm just going, yeah, I'd have to change that, I'd have to change that, I'd have to change that, um, it's exhausting and editors are looking to do as little work as possible <laughs> while you know, publishing a great book. Because every editor I know is overworked. Yeah. Um, so you want to be the person whose prose is so perfect that even if they didn't like your story as much, they'd be like, yeah, but it would be so easy and they're so nice to work with. Maybe we should just give her a shot, you know? Because um, that, that happens, that happens. I know people who are not as, not as brilliant as some of the other people I know, but they get more work because they are really professional and their stuff is really clean. Um, yeah, I've got a bunch of stories about that, but I'll pass it on. Um, for me, I would, uh, I want to know, in the qu query letter, I want to know the character and the main conflict of the story. Um, and, if there's some sort of a 
because we publish science fiction and fantasy, if there's some sort of theme or big idea, especially in science fiction, um, a lot of times there's a big idea. So I want to know that. I want to know what your credentials are, if you have any publications. Um, and that's pretty much all. And then I would, I mean, we usually want a synopsis, which is a separate thing. Um, it's short. I don't remember exactly how many pages, but nothing longer than like three pages. And then the first three chapters. And if you send the whole novel, I might still read the first three chapters, but I might be annoyed because I said you, I wanted the first three chapters and you yeah. sent the whole. I mean, because it's an electronic submissions, we only take electronic submissions because um, it saves in a lot of paper and mailing back and all sorts of stuff. So, um, so that's us. Yeah, I think the, the rule for cover letters is always less is more. I think if you, you know, and, and I've seen some that are almost the Reader's Digest condensed version of the book. It just goes on and on and on. It gets into world building and that kind of stuff. And, and if you're sending this to an agent or an editor who works in science fiction and fantasy, they get that there's more to it than just this, you know, this one sentence uh, log line. Um, but that's what, you know, uh, exactly that. You want to know who the hero is, who the villain is, and what the, why they are bumping into each other, right? What's the central conflict in the, in the, in the concept behind the book? Yeah, I wouldn't go beyond a sentence or two with, with any sort of synopsis in, in a query letter. Um, I think you should definitely, uh, if you have an idea about, about who this book is for, um, if, you know, right. if you feel like you know who the audience is, definitely include that. Um, you know, and to say, this is for readers of Stephen King, that, you know, well, great. You know, how many of those are there? You know, but... Um, <laughs> If you say, you know, this is for readers of, uh, I don't know, if you're a little more specific of, say, Brandon Sanderson. This is, I feel like this is a Brandon Sanderson book. He's, I mean, he's big, he's a, he's a New York Times bestseller, but um, at the same time, he has a, a specific, that's a specific audience that you're looking for, so. I think I, I teach a class at the University of Washington, and one of the things I have students do is try to uh, write the cover copy for their, their manuscript, mm -hmm. and also, write an elevator pitch, which is the, you know, one sentence um, summary. And it's a really useful exercise because a lot of times you have trouble doing that and that can help you identify that something's wrong with your book. If you have trouble writing, uh, summarizing your book in three sentences, the kind of three sentences that you put in a query letter, uh, you need to go back and think about your plot and, um, you know, maybe there's something there that you need to condense or change in some way. So I would agree with everyone that was saying, you know, you just want to see short couple sentences uh, in that query letter. Uh, for us, when we are s uh, receiving submissions, since we do work for hire, uh, we're more interested in what are your writing credentials, what, what is your background as a writer. Uh, we do want to see a sample, but um, in terms of just that cover letter, uh, what matters is, you know, what you've written and um, what your background as a working writer is. And, you know, I suppose this is more for outside of the work for hire sphere. Everybody gets their start somewhere. Everybody publishes their first novel, you know. So at some point you are going to have to send out a manuscript and cop to the fact that you aren't already a best-selling author and this is why you've never heard of me. But think about the, what are your credentials for writing this anyway? Is there anything interesting about you that you can that you can add to that query letter that that says, you know, this is a, a military science fiction novel, and I'm a 20 year veteran of the U.S. Navy. Now all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, there might be some authenticity to this, yeah. right? So anything like that, and I uh, certainly going toward you know uh, the shared world or work for hire sphere. If you can say I've been playing D and D for 20 years, at least that says we don't have to walk you through every little bit yeah. <laughs> of the, of the minutiae. If you're a fan and say, look, I've been a fan of this forever, I think that, that helps at least a little. Yeah. yeah, and also if you are a social media maven, um, I recent, not recently, I guess it was, when did we publish stuff for you? I can't remember, 2008 or something? Anyway, that was a first time author, Kimberly Polly, and she, but she had um, really formed a following uh, with, her website that she had, and so that was another boost 
um, that's a really good marketing thing. Uh, publishers everywhere are interested in that. Um, so think about that as well. That can be a credential. Yeah, next question. Hi, I was interested in actually knowing more about what being an editor is like. Can you like maybe talk about what a typical day would be like? Well, it's usually <laughs> lunch you in at the Russian Tea Room, right, <laughs> with uh, Norman Mailer. And I usually have two Manhattans at yeah. lunch. <laughs> There's uh, for me there. I, I I love movie and TV portrayals of book editors. <laughs> They're just I love that. Like the characters from Woody Allen movies and stuff who just have these fabulous giant apartments and it, it just seems as though this is a job that of course must pay you millions, you know. Um, <laughs> nope. Yeah, divided by 10,000 it does. Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, it's, you're gonna be overworked, underpaid, um, underappreciated, underutilized, or is this just me personally? <laughs> I, I, I have baggage, but, uh, <laughs> It, it, it can be a tough and thankless job, believe me. I think the most surprising thing to people is that it's not all about reading and writing all the time. There's a lot of public speaking that you have to do, like this. Um, but not just this, like within a company, um, not at Wizards, but in previous jobs I've had um, a lot of, there's a lot of meetings that you have to go to where you have to present the book that you're publishing and get people excited about it. Um, there's a lot of marketing that you have to do. You have to think about a marketing plan for your book and um, try to push the PR people to work harder for your book and your author. Um, so it's, I mean, of course, there's reading, there's writing, um, but there's that aspect as well. It, yeah, it's almost like a cult of personality at some of these bigger houses, you know, it's, and also kind of a pyramid scheme. So there are definitely <laughs> people <laughs> who, who make money at the top, right? But... Um, it's like Scientology, but not with less yeah. money. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also, it also makes a big difference whether you're like an acquisitions editor or whether you're just a copy editor. Like there, sure, there yeah. are definitely folks like some of my copy editors that work for me, just what they do is all day, you know, read, edit, enter changes, like that's their thing. Um, but a lot of editors have to do both where it's the sort of thing you talk about where you need to champion a book. You may, depending on the structure of your company, need to deal with agents and actually do the contract stuff. Um, the selling the book, if you say, oh, this book is great, I wanna buy it, and then you have to sell it to the publisher or whoever and say, no, 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 I really think this is worthwhile. Um, that can be its own song and dance, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that is kind of having a vision of what that book is, where, you know, where it fits in the market, who, who's gonna buy it, you know, so, yeah. Thanks. Also, a lot of author handholding, depending on uh, <laughs> which w which company and which author you're with. I mean, some some authors you say, "Great, go for it," and they turn in the book, and you're fine. And then other authors need to be talked through. Um, you know, in shared world stuff, for instance, I'm the go-to guy for. You know, every time an author who's writing a book for me has a question about, like, well, in the game, how does X work? My job is to help them essentially be a one-man resource for their game knowledge, their world knowledge, stuff like that. Uh, but even uh, non-tie-in editors often end up doing that sort of thing where it's like, okay, well, author so-and-so is really depressed again, but that book's still on deadline, so you need to call them and do whatever it takes to get them to turn in the friggin' manuscript. <laughs> like, there, there actually yeah. is kind of a psychotherapist <laughs> angle to the job, and, and I've had authors call me weeping just weeping, openly weeping on the, <laughs> on the phone. Yeah. Um, you know, authors who call and yell and threaten and are <laughs> angry and write, you know, uh, letters and go over <laughs> editors' head to their bosses and say, this, is, this editor is bad and hates me. And, you know, so there is, it really is a, it's a very personal relationship between an editor and an author. And it, get, and it can get very, very deep. You know, and it, it, depending on how long you work with that with that person. And one thing that you might not expect is uh, your your uh, pleasure reading is is going to be extremely curtailed. Oh my God! Yeah. Um, I almost it's really really hard to find time to read for pleasure anymore. Uh, so much of my time is spent with you know with work reading. <laughs>
especially in the genre that yeah, you tend to work in. Say. I've only just now started to read fantasy again, but even then it feels kind of like a busman's holiday. I mean, I'm just, I'm really into cereal boxes lately. That's about <laughs> <laughs> what I can get there's some good. There's some good ones out there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah for sure. Wheaties is, no. <laughs> so I got the five-minute signal, but I think we, we can do at least one more. Okay. Let's try one more question. So having heard all that, mm -hmm. if you still want to become an editor, how would you get started in the business? I'm, I'll, I'll take that one. I think to in today's world, right, and, and, and by what I mean by today's world, both positive and negative. On the positive side, there is this explosion of new media that is more inclusive than ever in all of human history. And on the negative side, we're still struggling through a disaster in the publishing business that happened uh, with, you know, 2008, 9, and so on. Um, it was not pretty. It was very bad. So right now, if you see a job posting for editor wanted here, you know, especially a really good one with a good uh, press, you're going to be fighting against hundreds of experienced editors who have been unemployed for two or three years. How would you build a portfolio or I would I would do it. Yeah. Yeah. If you if, if you can do the internship through, you know, through a uh, university, that that's perfect. But at the other on the other hand, blog, right? Get out there yourself. Do your you know, start your own Oh, did <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> We're getting the, uh, the music will start playing and I'll be yeah, like, yeah. And my beautiful <laughs> wife. <laughs> She'll kill me if I don't say that. <laughs> I've, lost, I've sort of lost my train of thought. But, you know, I, I think now people have an opportunity to go out there and do what I did, which was very, very difficult to do, and I really was gluing paper down to other pieces of paper and sending it to an offset printer and paying an enormous amount of money, um, when now you can just do it for free on a blog. And so, you know, I, I think there really are some... People like John DiNardo at, at SF Signal and, mm -hmm. and John Ottinger at, at Grasping for the Wind, who have started to sell their uh, books to the to some of the bigger presses, and have kind of created a a career for themselves. It's not easy. It's not just an automatic thing. Well, I've got this WordPress blog, so therefore I'm famous. But um, they they inserted themselves. They just made their own luck. One way you can get experience as an editor is um, if you know writers who are writing and you know just volunteer to edit something for them. Writers are dying for critiques and feedback and um, not everyone is going to be wanting to read their 500 page manuscript. <laughs> um, so if you're willing to do that in depth and give them a feedback, um, do line editing, whatever, that can be a, a just a great training ground too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely the, the volunteering or internship thing. Definitely, you know, just do your research, find out, you know, there, there are quite a few publishing houses here. Just, you know, say, I'll be a slush leader for you. You know, give me any, any, anything and I'll do it. So. Got one should, minute. Should we just run down the line really quick and say, because I know most of us are on the internet and are happy to talk to people about these sorts of things. So, like, yeah. you're, uh, you're yeah, if you want to well, find I'm us fantasyhandbook.wordpress.com and there's a page there called Ask Phil. If you go click on that and just go down to the comments, ask a question. It's going to go to everybody who sees the blog, so it's not directly to me, but that's the whole point. And I answer those every time somebody posts there. I will answer specific questions. Yeah, and uh, I'm on Twitter at jameslsutter.com or uh, I'm at at jameslsutter.com and on Twitter at, at jameslsutter. I love talking to people. Yep. Um, Parasparapress.com, and I have cards if you want to um, contact me. Uh, <laughs> we, we are at Wizards of the Coast. Um, I have my own website, ninahess.com. But don't email me. <laughs> just kidding. I, that's just call her on the phone. I hear yeah, she likes no, that oh yeah. much call me. I, I like She prefers calls. personal <laughs> visits. Yeah. If you just show up in her office. That's yeah, yeah, wait good. outside the doorstep with, like, flowers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't do Twitter or anything like that. So. <laughs> He's the mystery man. He Internet also doesn't use a computer. It's all long. <laughs> it's, all, it's all fountain pens. Yeah. Like fountain pens and chisels and stone tablets. Mm -hmm. 
How many are we? I think we're out. Is that it? Okay. Right. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, panelists. What's your name? Yeah. Nate? Nate? Yeah. Nate? Yeah. Nice to meet you. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Sure. Right. Well, um, I mean, you know, just kind of see what we're offering on the website, you know? The